Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome. I'm Divya Kakad, I'm a partner at Graham Rocker. It gives me great um, joy to welcome you all today in uh, our forum. Where are you all dialing in from? We'd love to hear if you can use the chat, introduce yourself, tell us where you're calling in from. We can get some interaction started. Okay, look at that. Let me see. I'm calling in from Seattle. Oh, hi. Other folks from Seattle. San Francisco, Chicago, we love this. Well, without much further ado, um, actually, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a uh, quick background about us. Graham and Walker is a, a VC fund. We are on a mission to reshape the NASDAQ by supporting and investing in tomorrow's most powerful companies. Today, we are joined by uh, Ali, uh, Ali Rosenthal, and um, our very own Leslie Feinstein. I'm pretty sure you'll, you know, they are both very known people in the space. Uh, but I'll do very quick intros before I hand it over to them so that they can tell you a little bit about their own uh, backgrounds and their own, um, you know, their VC funds. But Ali is the founder and uh, managing partner of Lead Out Capital, which started in 2018. She was on uh, one of Facebook's earliest business hires, where she was instrumental in driving growth and adoption for Facebook Mobile. Ali was also most recently the VP of Partnerships at Wealthfront. Leslie, of course, um, has been an operator turned founder turned VC. In the last five years, she turned a twenty-five percent Facebook group, a twenty-five person Facebook group, into a fifty thousand strong community for women-founded startups and aligned investors. She also raised a VC fund, which is Scram and Walker, uh, to invest in and with the best of them. She is the founder and managing director of Graham Walker, um, which is why we are all here today. And as you all registered for today's forum, you submitted um, some questions which informed our discussion. Um, I tried to sort of weave in some of those questions, um, you know, um, and I'll, I'll use that in our discussion, but also please feel free to drop any other questions that you have uh, in the chat, we want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, and really, you know, just we want this to be valuable. So again, reminding you to drop in your questions as they come up. Uh, let's see, anything else? Oh, we are, we also, we are also recording this. So it will be available for you post, um, uh, post the, 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 the discussion. We'll send a, an email. Um, you know, so that anything that we've shared today, we'll try and sort of wrap it up and you'll have that um, uh, for afterwards. And without, you know, much further ado, I want to open it up to you guys, Leslie and Ali. Ali, let's start with you. Thank you so much, first of all, for joining us. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, Lead Out Capital and what do you invest in? What do you want founders to know about you and your VC fund? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to see so many faces and um, from all over the world. How cool. Um, yes, I founded Lead Out in 2018. We're on our fund too. We're um, software investors. We are generalists. So we focus on the stages known as pre-seed and seed. Um, and uh, we look for, uh, we have a what we call a founder market fit driven thesis. The idea being that at the stage we invest, uh, the best signal to product market fit, which is what we're all after, um, is kind of the founder's insight, understanding of a market, the customer in that market, how severe their problem is, and um, their insight about how to solve that problem with software. So we have built a portfolio of um, founders, founding teams, companies, products that um, are, are everything from marketplace businesses with a vertical SaaS component to uh, consumer software, um, mobile businesses um, in areas like logistics, supply chain, gov tech, um, mobile development, uh, DevOps customers. So we love to hear from founders who have hailed from a market that maybe has been overlooked by 
great software innovation. Um, it, either because they've been customers and experienced the problem, decided to solve it for themselves or work with others, or because they, you know, they care so much about the market uh, and the value that could be created by solving this customer's problem that they've leaned into it themselves and started writing, writing some code. Um, my professional background uh, includes um, operating and finance. Um, uh, as Divya mentioned, I was an early Facebook employee on the business side and very quickly gravitated to um, the, the opportunity in mobile actually before Apple came out with iOS, iOS dev, the iPhone itself, Android, et cetera. So I like to say to my founders, I know non-obvious when I see it. I like to bet on non-consensus and be right. That's how you create alpha. And at Facebook in an operating role, I felt the demand uh, for Facebook from uh, markets outside the U.S. as well as in the U.S. Um, uh, from you know from mobile usage, um, and so we we kind of pursued a strategy of building for certain types of phones, the software that powered the phones, and the um, distributors that managed access to that technology. Um, and then you know smartphones came along and kind of really changed the game. Uh, but it was really fun and we drove a ton of growth with this strategy and just trying to really solve the problem for the user and meet them where they were and um, gotten to work with a bunch of other uh, startups as an angel investor, um, spent some time in, in fintech and other operating roles. I got my principal side sort of investing training um, at a, a larger later stage growth equity firm called General Atlantic Partners. And then after spending some time in operating roles in Silicon Valley, um, spent about a year and a half with Greylock doing earlier stage, so sort of series B and A investing, uh, and then did a bunch of my own angel investing and uh, decided to start start lead out based on actually a bunch of what I'd experienced um, in Silicon Valley with respect to um, the opportunity to invest in founders who are non-obvious, but who are customer segment experts who may be overlooked by traditional venture capital. And it's, uh, it's so far it's proven uh, to be a, a strong strategy. And it's something I, I love to do, work with founders who really understand a problem and are passionate about solving it for their customers. Love that. Non-obvious, but customer segment experts. Uh, I think that's very similar to, I bet Leslie is going to talk about that. That's kind of similar to our thesis as well. Uh, Leslie, uh, do you want to share a little bit about Grumman Walker and what you like to see in founders? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, Ali, it is uh, such a pleasure and honor to finally get you on our stage. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, and also a special thank you for committing to it while on vacation without really having the chance to like think about what you were signing up for. So hopefully we'll make it, um, we'll make it fun for you. And our goal today is to keep, is it Flair? Flayde? I don't know how to pronounce your name, but she's in the Philippines or they're in the Philippines and we're going to keep you engaged until 4 a.m. That is our goal today. Um, so um, I like to start uh, my founder pitch calls by saying that I have personally been a founder far longer than I have been a VC, um, certainly an operator way longer than I've been a VC. Um, I, I think that um, I... I think that that is the more fun job. Um, and I think that the best part of being a VC is to get to partner with founders. It's sort of like you get to come in and meet someone and support them at the start of this like Herculean journey. Um, it's almost like they're going on this odyssey and you get to be a, just a tiny little part of that. Um, and I think that it really changes you in a really good way. Um, and so that's a very long winded way of saying that um, I have a very high appreciation for the job that you all have um, and recognize how hard um, and frustrating and um, exhilarating it is uh, generally all at once. Um, I raise a VC fund um, purely and simply because um, the Female Founders Alliance felt like it needed to exist and it felt like probably the most important thing that I had done in my life as in you know not to have delusions of grandeur but I just didn't think that I could top it myself like I was like if I ever build something more important than this I will be shocked 
Um, and so I should probably, um, I should probably think really seriously about what this is and how it can go forward. Um, and the way that we think about investing out of the, you know, out of that incredible um, community uh, of founders, that is the Female Founders Alliance, uh, is we look for um, technology solutions to deeply human problems. Um, and so, you know, we like to look a little bit further down in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, we are probably a little bit less interested in um, longevity and the quantified self than we are about like how frustrating it is to get your kids into bed at the right time and like find childcare and, and, you know, like take care of yourself and like self-help, you know, like, I mean, um, like all of the things that like real everyday people live, which I think um, coincides a lot with how Ali is describing her thesis, because it's not something that most VCs, you know, just look at the demographic makeup of VCs. It's not, it's not problems that they might necessarily understand. Um, we focus on, on three big buckets. One uh, is work. Um, we like solutions that make work work better for everyone. Um, the second is health, uh, improving outcomes, improving access to health. Um, and the third is unpaid work uh, or caretaking uh, or managing the home, the family. Um, and within those three buckets, um, we like to look at pre-seed uh, founders in North America. Um, okay, I, I think that that kind of describes what we what we invest in. Should we like dig yeah. into what that pre-seed part of that whole spiel means? Let's let's do that. Actually, before we um, get in, I I wanted to take a quick poll uh, of this room. Can you all, Jenna, if you can share the poll in the chat, um, can can you guys quickly, um, you know, just answer the question of where you are in your uh, fundraising journey? How many of you are raising for the first time versus have raised prior for this company that you're building right now? Okay, that's very cool. Well, okay, so we have a we have a good amount of folks who have raised before, but it seems like sixty percent are raising for the first time. Okay, good. This is good to know because it'll sort of shape our discussion. Uh, let's start with, sorry, this just popped up. Okay, now I can see you again. Let's start at the, uh, you know, at the beginning. Um, for the new founders in this call, can you share a little bit about how they can tell if, you know, VC is the right financing for them? Um, I want to dig into sort of valuation and factors just a little bit later. Let's just talk about first, okay, how do you know if VC is what you should be seeking for your company? Ali, do you want to take this? Oh, how do you think about whether or not VC is is right for, for your yeah. company? Um, well, uh, I mean, it, it. there's some kind of, let's call it like, hard and fast constraints, I think, to, that are worth thinking about. And then you know, there's maybe the sort of softer, I'll start with the former, which is most VCs are set up to return to their investors, a group of people we call LPs, or limited partners, and we're general partners, um, it, like in some sort of like range of IRR, internal return on um, investment, and then, um, Kind of multiple on invested capital, uh, and so when we think about building a portfolio and hopefully returning, you know, some sort of industry benchmark, top quartile, top decile number to our investors, so as to be able to continue to build our business, um, we think a lot about how we populate that that portfolio, and so there's just some basic math, you know, to think of, think through if you're thinking through how. Um, Leslie or I would be thinking about uh, the product you're building, the market you're building it in, you know, kind of the um, and so at the stage that lead out focuses on kind of pre-seed and seed, we, we look for like hundred X kind of, we, we, we want to sort of see, can this business um, like exponentially grow in value? Um, and Partly the reason that technology and software 
uh, really in, in terms of product became the provenance of, so, of venture capitalists is because the margins um, are so rich um, and scale is possible over a short period of time, like incredible scale. So um, if you're building something that um, is very expensive on a unit economic basis to build, like each one of your widgets is, is quite expensive, um, that doesn't feel like a category that can scale um, with high margins and high profitability. Um, over time, you know, there may be some, what people call a J curve in your business where there's, you're not making a lot of money for a while. And then you can really kind of pop in terms of your growth, um, your revenue growth, your business growth. Um, which is not to say that's, that any other business isn't a terrific business. There are high cash flow businesses that over time build revenue on a less exponential basis, where as an, as an owner of a structure, like an LLC or an S corp, um, as a founder owner, you can build a terrific business, but it may not be the right business for venture capital to invest in if it doesn't if it doesn't have the components of of yielding that very very high 10x to 100x return on invested capital. Um, and so, the, again, the categories that tend to categories of product type or business model tend to be um, around innovation and things that can like hyperscale. Um, so if you're really passionate about building, you know, a physical product or something that's um, got high uh, capital expenditure for a while and or may always, or is more niche where you could own a ton of the market, but not like, but the market's kind of small, um, you might think about alternative forms of capital because the faster you could potentially get to cash flow positivity or profitability, the more you can guarantee that you stay the owner operator, you can take profits out of the business, you can grow the business at different times. Um, venture capitalists tend to look for businesses that are going to have like a real J curve where it's just, you're going to build, you're going to be heads down, you're going to be burning through money with the goal of 100xing your business. Um, so that's kind of more of the structure around like the numbers and sort of the hard constraints. And then there's also the sort of call it softer stuff to consider, which is I alluded to, and I think, you know, Leslie talked about being a, a founder herself, um, is kind of, do, do you want to live with this? Is this is going to be your baby? And do you want to live with it for a long, long time through the ups and the downs and the unknown? And it's a, it's a huge risk. And you give up a bunch of control in your business on your cap table from early on. So, you know, uh, when you take venture capital, you sell a lot of the ownership in your business almost from the get-go, like, significantly, um, which you might not have to do if your business um, can grow more slowly and more and, and over time kind of have a shorter horizon to profitability, um, but maybe not as large of an outcome. So it's also thinking like, who do I want to be partnered with? What are their expectations? Do I want that for my business? Do I want that for my strategy? Do I want to give up some control? Because in, in venture is what we call very expensive capital. You're, you're not taking a loan from a bank and financing it at a rate you know you can pay back. You are selling a stake in your business, in your sweat equity. So you have to also think like, is that the right sort of partnership structure from the get-go for my idea, for my vision, for like what I hope for, you know, everything I'm putting into this? And the answer may be yes, but I think there's a component of, is what I'm building capable of creating the type of value that venture capitalists look for? And do I want to be partnered with that kind of investor, that kind of money, that kind of approach to building value. Thank you. Let's say anything to add to that. Mm -hmm. Just on the margin, because that was a, a really great um, and complete answer. Uh, and also to kind of bridge us towards talking about how much to raise and what valuation to raise up. Um, so the wrong reasons to raise venture capital are because you need money. That's just not like, it's not you know, because you need money, because you think that you're supposed to be because friends did it. Um, so you really want to be really, really thoughtful about the journey that you're getting yourself in. And I want to add two qualifiers to what Ali is saying. One is um, there's a difference between raising venture and raising angels. Like angel investors, individuals have a much, much, much broader um purview like it's it's their literal money and there's some angel investors out there who invest like VCs 
Like they're looking for those really long-term returns. And there's some angel investors that are just investing in their passion, investing in the people that they know. Um, they might be investing for shorter term returns. They might be investing in things that that like out in the in the market might look more like private than they look like venture capital. So so like, you know, when when I say like, is it right for VC? I'm talking like we are talking specifically about venture capital funds. Um, you may be able to raise from angel investors um, and have a different path to your company. The second and related qualifier to to um, Ali's explanation is the time horizon. Um, and so um, free to, you know, as much as you might sort of fancy yourself, Steve Jobs, and, and there, there might be one of you here, right? Like, most companies are not going to get that 100x exponential return within three or four or five years. Most companies are going to take quite a while uh, to get to that size of exit. Um, and most companies are are, are not going to make it in the process. And so that kind of willingness to commit for the long haul makes, makes venture capital a better path for you versus like if what you're looking for, and, and I, I say this because I, I see it a lot, um, there are paths to building and selling a company that for an individual founder are nothing short of life-changing that do not involve venture capital. And that in fact are not good for venture capital. And so I see pitches that look like we're gonna sell it in two years to Facebook or to Meta, or we're, you know, like we're building this and like the industry's consolidating and we're gonna get a 10X return within, within two years. That doesn't get anywhere close to the type of return that we need to see in order for the investment to be meaningful. Um, so that if, if you truly believe that that is your path, then you're much better off bootstrapping the thing, um, finding a loan. Um, although I, I don't generally recommend taking on debt for risky companies, but you know, it's, we're all grown ups. um, or, or finding angel investors that can come along for the ride and kind of have like a really, really healthy return, uh, within a short period of time. Um, Yeah, those are my two qualifiers. And and kind of when you're raising from angels versus raising from VCs, there are different dynamics when it comes to company valuations, which I think is is the direction that we're going to head to next. So I'm going to give it back to you, Divya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all, I mean, great. I'm, I'm glad we talked about this because I think coming into the fundraise, like let's now talk about that, you know, okay, so you're now ready to fundraise. You know, this is where you, this is, this is how you want to go with your financing. Uh, let's talk about valuation, right? Because this has been a hot topic for the last few months. Um, can you both shed some light on what factors go into uh, determining um, your valuation? And also like touch a little bit about like who does it? Like do, do founders, are founders the ones who should have a sense of what, you know, what their companies are valued at? Are investors the ones who should be doing it? Can they negotiate? Um, how does that process work? I I want to start. Um, I want to start all the way at the end, so mm -hmm. that we can kind of bring us back to the beginning. Um, and that is like, how much is a public company worth? Like, if you go Google, um, Google Microsoft. Oh, that's ironic. Um, uh, if you go Google, um, the capitalization of a large public company that is in itself a valuation cap it's literally a valuation cap um and at that level um that company valuation is based on investors collective expectation of the company's future profits and growth so like how much do we think that that company is going to provide us in terms of um stock price growth and in terms of um, stock dividends, like returning it to us in the form of cash. So it's like the present value of the expectation uh, of future revenue, uh, future dividend streams. When you're out in the public market, those valuations are based on very, very well-defined data. That's why public companies are reporting their financials um, on a quarterly basis so that investors can look at those financials and make a decision based on that and based on the market and based on whatever trends they they believe they are seeing, how much do I believe that the company is worth? And I'm gonna either buy that stock or sell that stock. Now, 
that that is like the ultimate, you know, the most data driven approach to a company valuation. If you work backwards in time from from that public company with a lot of very carefully gathered and reported data uh, and like very rich, predictable data all the way to a new business with no data, kind of work backwards from that. The valuation gets closer and closer and closer to um, a pure demand supply and further and further from data about the business that you will actually have. And so at the very, I, I, I hope that what I'm saying is making sense. At the very, very, very earliest stage, when your company has probably no revenue, if it has any revenue, it's probably not very indicative of what your future revenue is going to be. Like you're so early that you really don't have enough data that can be modeled about the future value of your business. And so basically investors have to take it on faith. And they have to kind of like make an educated guess about how big can this get and what is a fair way to factor in the risk uh, of that company in the very earliest stage. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about that in like from the no data, I call that um, faith capital, <laughs> um, which is essentially what you're doing at the very, very earliest stage. You say stage. fade? Faith. <laughs> Oh, like faith. faith. I was like, what's like, faith? That's so interesting. Okay, got it. Faith, faith. Okay. Yes. Faith. Um, yeah. All the way to like very data driven capital. Um, And, and private company multiples. Um, when in our valuation, when we think when we kind of like bigger than a bread box, try to think about how big a company could be in terms of size of the market, competition in the market, the growth of that company, that sort of thing. Um, but if it's a if it's a market where founders have leverage, oftentimes they're setting the terms. Uh, oftentimes because they're creating sort of a auction economics process in their round where there is asymmetric in information that as an entrepreneur you have, which is like, look, I've got a bunch of people who are really interested in working with me and give me money. It's like, you're selling your house. Like your house might be worth, if you added up the value of the depreciated wood and steel and glass and maybe the land, like you're going to have a number, but like if someone's willing to pay you three times that, like that's what it's worth. Um, so uh, in markets where there's a lot of money being put to work by investors and a founder is can create some auction economics, you know, there's a point at which it becomes ridiculous, but you can you have more control over setting the price and people do that at the earliest stage, oftentimes using a note or um, like a loan that most people call a safe note. And you guys all are probably familiar with that. And if you're not, look it up. Um, and then a price round typically means that there's a little bit more traction in the business, a little bit more numbers where you can justify uh, evaluation. And again, that's going to come oftentimes from public company comps. So people will look at, well, if Workday is trading at whatever it is, revenues and 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 earnings growth, you try to kind of back up. But it's it's typically a discussion between the the founding team and and how much demand there is on the part of investors to you know, to, to own a piece of the future cash flows and the future value that they create. Um, and so in a market like this, where there's been a massive slowdown, um, and frankly, investors probably have more leverage and it's taking longer to raise rounds. And um, uh, there's a lot more, the, you know, I think of this, of this market, <laughs> I've heard it a couple of times, you know, sort of attitude of investors is like, no one, no one got fired for buying IBM, right? So like public companies stayed proven, you know, if you, you know, you're going to get paid your dividend, it's not going anywhere. And so investors now are taking a lot more, more time than um, oftentimes investors will set the price. So I think it really is a function of the market where your business is at. Um, when, and when at the early stage founders are driving valuation, sometimes it can be a function of how well 
you tell a story, but it's certainly a function of how much heat or demand you can create and, and sort of manage that asymmetric information around, um, you know, the, the demand for, for, um, by investors for participating in your in your opportunity. And when investors are more scared and taking their time and need a lot more diligence, then it, it may come down to more of the, you know, what what can you show? What can you evidence either in your business or in your ability to build product or your knowledge of the customer that makes, that gives you kind of a unique and advantaged edge to making something go in a market that's harder to, you know, sign a new contract or raise your ACVs. So um, I think there's a lot of it is just market at our stage. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Do you, would you say that in your experience, have you ever passed on a, on a, a company that shows up with a wild valuation? Like what is, you know, mm -hmm. how does it show up in like on a day-to-day on -day, uh, basis when you see it in, in your deal flow? Have we, have I passed on things that have gotten wildly valued? Yeah, absolutely. Some of them have come down in this market. Let's talk about, yeah, we're going to talk about that like really quickly, right? Like we've, we we've, all have the things that we miss, you know, you're trying to make, you're trying to execute on your strategy. You're try, at least we try to do what we told our LPs we would do. Um, and, you know, we see stuff that is a really awesome opportunity, but maybe it's not the founder market fit that we said we would pursue. Um, so you got to stick to your, got to stick to your strategy. Um, Anything to add there? Yeah, I would say, um, so yes, we frequently pass on rounds, like, or, or rather I would say um, as a fund, we are disciplined uh, in terms of like what we will and will not invest in. Like we have a target ownership and a target check size and we fall on the disciplined side of sticking to that. I know that there's other funds that, that have like a lot more leeway. And that is also because of what they promised their LPs versus what I promised my LPs. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's, you know, yes, you can absolutely get your valuation cap wrong. And the consequences of getting your valuation cap wrong is just that it makes it harder to raise the next round. Um, when I look at companies, and, and hey, for the record, like making it harder to raise the next round for a true VC fundable company is a death sentence because like these are not companies that can like chug along on on you know on on like tiny revenues particularly if we're talking networks FX companies like true J care companies so so not being able to raise the next round is a is a is like can be a death sentence for the company um and so we really want to make sure when I look at a company it's less about precisely how much does this founder think this company is worth today and for me it's more about do I believe that they can beat this valuation within 12 to 18 months and raise a really healthy round the next time around? Um, and if the founder is kind of greedy in the short term, like, they're, you know, they're really kind of optimizing for a high valuation in their first round, and it's a really hard market out there, um, then I hesitate because the, the financing risk down the line means that that company uh, is probably going to get stuck in this like no person's land of of not being able to raise because they didn't get enough traction and and then like there's not a good story to go out and raise additional capital from investors. Um, so that's what it means to me to get it wrong. I I like to tell founders like, um, if you are short term greedy, you're long term stupid. I, and pardon me for just being so blunt about that, but like the the past few years of like the tippy tippy top market, like the very, very, very frothy VC market. Um, we were all collectively celebrating the valuation and the round size and the fundraise. Um, but in reality, this round is not success. Like the round itself is not success. Success is getting your company to the exit. You know what I mean? Like your success is long-term. And this round is just one part of that very long journey towards an, an outsized Herculean outcome. Um, and so I really wanna make sure that the round that you are raising sets you up really, really well for going on that on that journey for the long term. And by the way, that that even that statement means different things for different founders. 
Like there's founders that can command much higher valuations just by virtue of who they are and what experience they have. Um, and, and there's founders who are much less unproven, um, who are going to have to kind of work a little harder to prove themselves uh, in the early days in order for, for the market to reward that with higher valuations. I, I want to, because you've already touched on this, I want to, you know, uh, talk a little bit about founders who may have raised at a valuation that they can't beat. Um, when the markets were, you know, just different looking a year ago. Um, so what does it, what does it mean for them when they're going out today and they have to maybe, you know, have a raise at a down round or at flat rounds? What does that mean in terms of signaling? What does that mean for you as a as a as a investor when you see these founders? You want to go first, Sally? Or... Well, sure. I mean, I think the short answer is uh, if you're a founder and you believe in your vision, this is what you want to be working on. If you know it can get there, you need the capital. Like this is kind of a cost of doing business. Not that's not really your fault, but uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to take money at a, that's more expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to, it, and, and it probably creates an even higher bar um, at the most primary level, which is with the founder and management about whether or not they want to sign up, like whether or not they believe in the market and in, in the opportunity to, to, to take more expensive capital. It's much easier to raise five on 50 <laughs> um, uh, or, you know, so, some of the, some of the valuations we saw in the blockchain and, and web three run up or the generative AI stuff right now, um, you know, it's just, it's, uh, you can, you can settle yourself with a lot of expectation and, and, and capital uh, with the capital employees, you know, you can kind of dig, dig deep. And if, if there's, if you don't actually kind of, have a strategy and and have enough evidence that convinces you that it's worth it. It 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 can be um, it can be really hard. Um, but if you you know if you if you believe uh, and you you have evidence that convinces you and you built conviction, then yeah, you might have to take capital that at terms that you didn't see in twenty twenty one. It's really hard to build businesses. Um, I think for the past ten to fifteen years, founders uh kind of got got the benefit of a, a lot of you know globalization trends free money um a, a bunch of kind of secular shifts in in consumer and and um and enterprise behavior around technology and mobile and uh it's not to it's not to throw shade at what people have built um over those past 10 to 15 years but i'm not sure it's the best signal to the entrepreneurs of today um as to what it means to and looks like to build a, a business for the long term, build something to last, it, it takes a while. Um, and if you have conviction, but and it costs a lot, and you have to close that gap between where you are revenue wise and profitability wise, and where you could be with a little more capital, then sometimes you have have to have to take it. Um, and hopefully, you're taking it from investors who have also kind of built the conviction on their own and alongside you you with your guidance um, as to how to help you get there. And they're not jamming you just because they can. Because like, why would I want to be in a business that is ultimately going to be a write-off a year and a half from now? Like I either believe your plan um, and believe that my capital will help you get there and my involvement will help you get there. Or I just, you know, I, I probably shouldn't do the deal if I can't, you know, just because I could do it at half of what you did it the last time you raised doesn't mean it's a good investment. So I think, you know, having the, you know, having the discipline to find the fat, the uh, partners, um, the investors um, who challenge your plan, ask you the hard questions and together you get conviction around how you would spend the capital in, in a raise that might be a down round to, raise that next round at the valuation that, that you believe you deserve, maybe the tough medicine you have to take, but it might actually turn out really well. And if you can't convince yourself, then it's, it's going to be very hard to convince, I think, the type of investor who will give you the best shot at bridging that gap. That's my view. Um, 
Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think, I mean, going from a world of free capital, like zero interest rates, um, tons of cash flushing, flushing around the system, um, literally looking for entrepreneurs to take it. <laughs> like, you know, these massive funds were literally looking, where can they place lots of money quickly? Um, to high interest rates, expensive dollars, lots of opportunities in the public markets, lots of opportunities in private equity, lots of opportunities in real estate. Like there's all kinds of places to put your money today that are far less risky um, than venture capital. So going from, from like A to B, I think um, it has also changed a lot of perspectives um, in terms of like, what is the signaling that a company um, is giving out when they have to do something like a down round or something like a loan or, or what have you. I think um, if you would have asked any investor five years ago, like what happens if I take a down round? It was like, a, you know, hugely bad signal, right? Like, oh my God, they didn't execute. Like if you can't find money in this market, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they were really, really stigmatized. But I think Today, that's no longer the case because there's an entire generation of companies, some of which are really, really, really good companies that were raising at what was market terms two, three years ago and and are, is very far from market terms today um, and just can't grow into those valuations. So I would say in terms of like, what happens if I have to raise a down round? What happens if I have to take some like onerous loan or which again, I don't recommend, but you know, don't mortgage your house for it. Um, I think that there's a lot less stigma around doing what you have to do today. Um, and, and so if you do believe that it is a bridge to somewhere, right? Like you're not just sort of extending the inevitable, but like you believe that you can, you can J curve the thing. Um, and frankly, that like you still have it in you to keep going and your team still has it in them to keep going then by all means go out and do what you need to do and what you need to raise to like keep going and turn around that company and like wait for the better market for exits um for us do we participate in like I, I don't think we have ever participated in a down round we have participated just just like you know it's it's hard to go down from a pre-seed right so um, so it's sort of the stage at what we're investing, but but we certainly have participated in 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 small extension rounds that are like flat to the last round, and it, every investor is different, um, and so I'll just sort of share how we think about it versus I, I don't think this is how everyone thinks about it, but for us, what we really care about is again, um, are you raising enough to get somewhere that you can grow into, right? Like really have that like. Um, those, those tailwinds towards your next round. Um, second, do you still have the support of your earlier investors? Um, and, and that's a big deal for us. Like, um, because if you don't, then, ooh, you know, that, that, that can be quite a, a negative signal. And, you know, in some cases there's a story around it and we're cer certainly open to hearing it. Um, and then third, are there other smart investors that are also coming on board? Um, and that could be angels, right? Like, are you able to sell this? Um, like, can you convince folks? Uh, and that's, that's just by virtue of the fact that we are a very, very small fund and like our check size is not enough for the round to, to, to like really fill around. Um, and so we, we need to be investing in like good coalitions of people and funds. Um, and, and like, if those three things are true, or at least two of those three things are true, then we're very, very open to it. In fact, one of our best investments was an extension round from two years ago. Um, and um, and it was an extension round of a, off of a company that I had missed um, on their pre-seed simply because um, I didn't have a VC fund <laughs> at the time that they did their pre-seed. I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have money to invest. Um, and so, I, you know, I feel really, really lucky that I got to uh, to get into that round at the little kind of flat extension. Okay. There's questions here in the in the chat room, Divya. Yes, um, I was going to get to that. Can we just uh, talk really quickly about the market? Um, so we we we've talked a little bit about how things have changed. Um, how, are you guys seeing any signals of it rebounding, or rather, what are the valuations that you are seeing in these early stages right now? Like, is this what is your sense of how the market was? 
the dip that it took and where we are today? Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't see it rebounding at the pre-seed or seed level. I'm not sure that pre-seed or seed kind of took the fall or there was room for the valuations to come down sort of structurally in the way that like the publics and the later stage, call it series C through E, um, did. Um, uh, someone sent um, so a, a blog that Carta had done recently in the chat that that I'd looked at a while ago. Um, it was pretty good. Um, I think there's like some bounce there, but like way bounce back in the later rounds, but um, on a much smaller uh, number of deals done. Um, and so I, I think the the pace with which things are getting done is taking longer, if at all, at the pre-seed and seed stage. Um, there just wasn't like the com compression in valuation that, um, you know, some of the later stage uh, run-up experienced, I think, justifiably based on the fundamentals. Um, I think the the compression that in valuation is effectively like those deals just never get financed or never get done at the pre-seed and seed stage. Um, we're certainly seeing more extensions, more down rounds. Um, uh, uh, I've yet to see like a lot of M and A. Um, I think in 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 headier times, you see uh, at the pre-seed or seed or Series A level, you'll see more uh, appetite for. Um, talent acquisitions, but I've not seen that at all um, uh, of late. So I think it's probably stating the obvious, but you know, where you're seeing higher valuations and kind of crazy valuations is in, in the kind of generative AI space. Um, but, you know, for, for funds like mine and, 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 and I think Leslie's is just that that's a, it's hard to, it's hard to participate in those rounds because of kind of the structure and the math um, that we kind of, run our funds around. Uh, so those will happen. They'll happen in the Y Combinator demo day coming up and, um, you know, the bigger funds that are multi-stage and are just trying to kind of index the market or like know what's going on. We'll pay, we'll pay those valuations. And then I still think there's a fair amount of uh, pain that the private and earlier stage market has to work through. Um, that uh, we may or may not see kind of, we may or may not get a preview um, of via like big public tech, right? Like NVIDIA or Meta or Google. So I actually, I think the the more as founders, you can have an evidence, real traction, real evidence of demand, whether it's in revenue, usage, uh, whatever it is, I think the more, uh, the, the better, uh, your financing rounds will go. It is really not a matter of storytelling right now. Um, I think it's much more if you if you if you have locked in uh, to to some early evidence of um, customer or product market fit. Uh, that is the the best way to I think run a, a successful round in this market. So I would say um, to Ali's point. Um, the data is out there for everybody to read, right? Like Carta, PitchBook, like all these publications are publishing um, on a quarterly basis what they believe the market is doing. Um, and by and large, it looks and feels like uh, those trends have stabilized. Like we're not we're not falling further. I don't think we're rebounding either. I think it's a new normal where we're going to just sit for a while. Um, with that said, I... I um, I think a different view than you, Ali, on on those earliest stage valuations. Um, I do think that there's a change at the earliest stage that is a little bit um, sort of masked by the data, which the data is just averaging all the rounds. Um, and so from where I'm sitting, looking at a, a pipeline that is like 99% women, um, what I would say is I do think that the sort of average and median pre-seed round valuation caps that I see are lower than they were um, a year ago. Um, can you um, can you give us some examples? It's super interesting to me. Yeah, so- um, So it goes from five to two, from 10 to five. What are you saying? I, yeah, I think like, whereas 10 was just like a given uh, a year and a half ago, I see a lot more at like three, five, eight. Okay. Um, 
Um, I don't think that those are picked up by Carta because one, more rounds just don't happen, right? So like if you come in at the, like they just kind of don't happen. There's fewer rounds happening. And so they don't end up reported in the numbers. Um, and two, I, I also think that like, the, it's a it's a buyer's market for investors right now. And just like uh, Ali was saying earlier, like um, no, nobody gets fired for investing in NVIDIA. Like the VC equivalent of that is like, nobody gets fired for investing in a white combinator company, right? Like, so, so there's more kind of like flight to, I hate, some investors call it flight to quality. I hate that term. I, what I really think it is, is like flight to job safety. So like investing in companies that are easy for these like junior partners to take to the partnership and say, look, high demand. And so that has kind of fed into the AI investing bubble. Um, I don't know if it's bubble, but like the AI investing boom, whatever it is, um, uh, bubbliness. Um, and, and I think that that, because like a lot of investors are flocking to the same deals that are a little bit easier to muster, like a little bit safer as far as VC goes, those rounds do keep the valuations uh, of years past um, because there's just a little bit more demand for them. But I think, uh, you know, the, the pipeline that I'm looking at is is like the, the a little bit not playing into that because it's a lot of new founders, a lot of first-time founders, a lot of overlooked founders um, who cannot easily command those higher valuations. And so, um, you know, that I think that the, the smarter founders uh, are a bit more pragmatic and they will just sort of set about like, they'll take in feedback on like, well, what do you think that this is worth? Where do you think that I should be raising? Or even better, they're taking in feedback of what investors think they should be raising at in the next round, right? Like, what do you think a seed looks like in this category? And then working backwards from that. Um, and just being super pragmatic and trying to close a round quickly, like setting evaluation that just like closes the round, um, as, as quickly and easily as possible so that you can take the money, start executing and start working against um, your, your next one. Um, and, and those rounds have ended up being like um, certainly well below the, the 10 million that we, ex that we would have expected um, a year ago. The other side of that is that um, some of the earlier companies from 2020, 2021 that are going back out to market to ask for money at around those same valuations, like those flat rounds, they have a lot of traction. So like if you're coming in asking for a 10 or 12 or 15 million post, um, and I'm looking at your deal and then I'm looking at this other deal with like 200 customers, and like three LOI, right? Like, uh, it's, you know, it, it's hard. It's really, really hard to justify. Um, so I, I do think that for like, for what I assume to be most of our community, um, yes, you are seeing lower valuations. It's not you. You're not, you're not nuts. Like you're not imagining it. Um, yes, you are seeing slow rounds. Yes, you are like those things are happening. It's not just you. Um, and, and like the, the average numbers to me, they tell a, a different story, which is there are founders out there that have an easier time raising more investors are flocking to them and they're driving the averages up. Um, but, but I don't think that that's the experience that most, most folks here are having some, some yes, but, but not most. Uh, Carly is asking a question which is very much related. She's asking for the lower valuations that you are seeing, are people generally raising less money or accordingly, or are they taking a higher dil dilution? From the from what I'm seeing, they're they're doing the 20%, like the full 20%. Um, so like a founder raising at a um five million post is raising uh, is raising about a uh, million dollars. Um, a founder raising at an eight million post is raising about one point five. So they're raising as much as possible without diluting themselves up to twenty more than twenty percent. Which is again like that's how I would have. That's the advice I would have given a decade ago. <laughs> like it was the it's the it's the frothy times where founders could get away with diluting themselves much much less. Um, and so it's a little bit of like back to fundamentals. There's also a really great question up here that I wanna. Yeah. Is um, it about stage? Because that was the, we have we have three minutes, so let's take couple more questions. Leslie, what, which one I, did you want? To... I just wanted to, to acknowledge a question here that I think was a, a reaction to something I said, which is how do I know if I'm being greedy? Mm -hmm. um, and um, and, and the, the truth is that if you don't have any data, then you don't. That's the problem. Like you're not actually being greedy. You're just being, um, you're just sort of um, like, you just don't know what you don't know. And so the first thing that I would say is like, go get yourself some data. 
right? Like you just heard me talk a bunch about what I'm seeing out there. You're hearing Ali talk a bunch about what she's seeing out there. Um, good data comes from investors before you are fundraising. What do you think is is fair? Um, and by the way, when I say it, like sophisticated investors, like ask people who are seeing a lot of deals. Um, if you don't want to ask them for your current round, ask them about your next round. Like what do seeds look like in this category right now? Um, and work your way backwards from that. And then the last thing I would say is like, if you get a term sheet and it's lower than you expected, don't be insulted. Like it's it's signal. They're they're giving you data, and you might not like that data. That's fine, but you can't take it personally. Um, so if you go out there with a proposed valuation and you hear a lot of investors be like, mm, then then that is data that like you might want to kind of reconsider um, where you come in. Uh, question over here about the average revenue multiple that you're seeing uh, for rounds. Um, Ali, do you have a gut oh, reaction? It's, I don't think my answer would be very useful. You have to be pretty specific for stage and category and this is for industry. A and I mean, I think this is where you can go and look at public company metrics in your space and just assume that an investor will. Like we'll look at kind of the multiples that, you know, the biggest market share, public company market share. In, in your space and it is is it hasn't if, if there's not a true comparison then a proxy um and i would just assume that an investor will you know, ultimately think about it that that way i think series a i've heard um kind of at least a million in revenue um and it has to be like a million in arr that you've done for at least a year not like oh we're going to get to a million dollars in ARR by the end of the year, it's like you're at a million and you're probably growing 100%. Uh, multiple wise, that's going to vary based on the sector and the business model. And I also want to just add that like at the pre-seed stage, I don't think there's any pre-seed investor that's investing on a, on a multiple. Um, it's just like there's just not enough known about your company. Um, yeah. to, you know, it's kind of a little bit garbage in, garbage out if they're investing off of a multiple. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. As I would yeah, about, if most of you guys are pre-seed founders, yeah. like revenue. So don't worry about that. Like yeah. that'll come into play around the series A or or more likely at the series B or later. Yeah. So at time, but so I want to be respectful of, you know, this, both of you and our calendars and everybody here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just so much gratitude. Uh, thank you everybody for being here uh, you will get an email from us with a recording so that you can you know re-watch it for all the tidbits that you got um, and of course uh, we are uh, accepting applications right now for uh, the Catalyst program uh, so if you are interested in uh, joining it's our two-week boot camp for fundraising please do you know check out our website the form is in there I don't know if uh, Jenna is able to drop the form in here uh, but just want to say thank you so much for joining thank you Ali Thank, Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's great to to spend time with you guys at um, Graham and Walker. And thanks for everyone for joining today and taking some time out of their busy day. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a I'll good rest of your day. Here too. Thank you, Allie. And thank you, everybody, for, um, for giving us your time. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye.